like to welcome everyone to the annual Naomi Pravakadar lecture. Um, I won't repeat everything that's in the program, but uh, those of you who knew Naomi knew what a wonderful woman she was and what a scholarly and, and learned woman she was and how she would have very much enjoyed attending these lectures herself. Um, this is the second annual lecture in our series, and we would like to thank the Kadar family and the Naomi Foundation for sponsoring these lectures, and I think they deserve applause for that. <laughs> We're very happy to see so many people from the family and the foundation here today. Um, and I think the first order of business is to introduce Dr. Avraham Kadar and ask him to say a few words about tonight's lecture. I'm going to read, uh, I see so many faces here that I knew Nomi and I agree with Paul, Nomi would have loved to hear that lecture. She actually heard it so many times, okay, Nomi would have loved to hear that lecture. She probably heard it so many times from Mark uh, that uh, in variation, so uh, I believe that uh, to see it in this uh, auditorium would have been wonderful um, experience for her. Um, good evening, esteemed program organizer, speakers, family members, and guests. I'm proud to welcome you to the second annual Naomi Pravar Kadar Lecture at YIVO. It is a rare privilege to have one Dr. Kaplan as a scholar in residence and this evening, we have two. Dr. Brucha Kaplan and Dr. Mark Kaplan have each, in their own right, established a distinct reputation among the preeminent Yiddish scholars of our time. Their academic home base is Johns Hopkins University, where Brucha teaches Yiddish language and Mark teaches Yiddish literature. I've come to know both Drs. Kaplan well over the last few years, and I can safely say that we have an intellectually stimulating evening ahead of us. Bucha will set the tone and share a bit about her own connection to Naomi, and Mark will surely infuse Yiddish literature with a fresh, modern perspective. Thank you so much, Mark and Bucha, for traveling all the way from Baltimore just to be here for this event. You are remarkable people and outstanding educators. The lecture series holds special significance for me, my children, and the Praver Kadar family. To us, Dr. Naomi Praver Kadar, Zichrona Livracha, represents how Yiddish should be taught in all its beauty depth and dimension. Naomi lived and breathed the Yiddish language at home and in school. In her adult life, and she became a Yiddish scholar and educator keen on exploring the cultural significance of the language and sharing it with countless pupils. To Naomi, Yiddish was not a historical fact, but rather a vibrant, relevant language and a part of a rich legacy. She knew how to bring Yiddish to life in her classroom, even for the uninitiated. As a teacher, Naomi embraced and encouraged each student as an individual. In the same vein, the Naomi Foundation seeks to make the study of Yiddish as meaningful and as exciting to a student reconnecting with his or her, or her roots as if it is a, a native speaker. Naomi remains the internal compass that guides the family and the foundation. Through programming such as this, with, we seek to carry on her values and vision and to pave the way for a new generation of learners to look at Yiddish with new, with new eyes. <clears throat> 
I would like to thank everyone at YIVO who made this lecture series and this evening in particular possible, especially Ella Levin, Dr. Paul Gleiser, and Dr. Jonathan Bren, and Lindsay Blank, the Naomi Foundation's Managing Director for her dedication to bringing this series to fruition. <clears throat> Finally, I would like to recognize my children, Maya, Nadav, and Enat, for un their unwavering commitment to upholding and honoring their mother's legacy. They are the founding force behind the Naomi Foundation and active members of the Board of Directors. Under separate auspices, my daughter Maya is leading a team of Yiddish academics, among them Dr. Adina Simet and Bruche, in developing a digital Yiddish language learning product that will carry on Naomi's life work and teaching methodology. <clears throat> you each make her proud in your own way and in everything you do. Thank you all for joining us, and I invite you to enjoy the evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Kadar, for your words and for your support. And since you mentioned Jonathan Brent, I just wanted to say that he sends his regrets. He was unable to attend because he is just recovering from surgery, and so he wished he could have been here tonight, but he sends his best. And now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Bruja Kaplan to say a few words. Thank you. I am delighted to have been given the honor of introducing tonight's speaker, Mark Kaplan, and the privilege of saying a few words about Naomi Prava Kadar, to whose memory tonight's lecture is dedicated. I thank the board of the Naomi Foundation for giving me this opportunity and Dr. Kadar for your kind words. Naomi Kadar, known to me as Nomi because we always spoke Yiddish together, was my best friend in graduate school. We were classmates in the graduate Yiddish studies program at Columbia and we shared many <laughs> joys and a good deal of tsaurus on the lengthy journey to the PhD. In the acknowledgments to her dissertation, Nomi was kind enough to write that I was the first place to turn for a warm and empathetic Yiddish word. That, of course, is exactly what Nomi was for me and many others with her sympathetic ear, her clear mind, and her aura of caring. Indeed, the thing about Nomi that remains strongest in my memory is not how she looked or what she said, but her quiet concern. My conversations with her must have given me much inner strength, the courage to overcome difficulties, because I still feel a sense of strength and encouragement when I think of her now. Of course, Nomi led by example. The difficulties of completing a PhD <laughs> pale in comparison with the battle Nomi fought against cancer, and yet she always kept going in a way I still find inspiring. I think that my sense Nomi really cared stemmed not just from her concern for my feelings, but also her respect for my particular talents. Another great common interest of ours was Yiddish pedagogy. We shared our materials for Yiddish language classes, and we had a similar approach to teaching. There was, however, a big difference between us. I learned Yiddish as an adult and did not grow up anywhere near a Yiddish cultural milieu whereas Nomi was a native Yiddish speaker and was deeply connected with the world of Yiddish culture. When I started teaching Yiddish, I wanted Yiddish to be like any other language. I wanted students to be able to brush their teeth, write a shopping list, or arrange a date in Yiddish. Nomi's example helped me to understand that this is not enough, that a Yiddish teacher must also, from the beginning, acquaint the students with the deep cultural history that the language embodies. My students still benefit greatly from the idiomatic conversations Nomi wrote for the first few weeks of study and the materials she prepared to guide students through Yiddish folk stories. <laughs> 
What did I contribute to our teaching partnership? A non-native speaker's understanding of some of the fine points of Yiddish grammar. Nomi used to call me when some detail of the grammar she was about to teach wasn't clear to her, and I was often, surpri and I was often surprised myself that I could answer her questions. Her appreciation of my knowledge was itself a gift. A conversation with Nomi's daughter, Enat, left me with a similar impression. Nomi asked Enat to help edit her dissertation. Enat's reaction was, who am I to help with such a task? And yet Nomi made it clear that Enat's contribution was genuinely useful. In Pirkei Office, The Ethics of the Fathers, we read, Ezehu chochem hamalamed mikol adam, who is a wise man, he who learns from every person. Nomi's appreciation of the talents of others reflected not only her own wisdom, but her quiet way of encouraging others by truly appreciating what they had to give. As you can read, as you can read in the program and as you have heard this evening, um, Nomi was a dedicated and innovative, innovative educator, as well as committed to teaching Yiddish language and culture. The foundation supports projects that strive for similar goals, and I would like to conclude by saying a few words about one such project that I think is furthering Nomi's educational and cultural goals in a very exciting way. This project is the Yiddish Farm, recently established in Goshen, New York. Yiddish Farm is an organic farm where Yiddish is the major language. This summer, the farm organized its first full-fledged summer program where students worked on the farm in the mornings and studied Yiddish in the afternoons. I had the pleasure of meeting a young woman who's here in the audience today, who knew no Yiddish at the beginning of the summer, and after three months on the farm, speaks fluently. The possibility of true immersion at the Yiddish farm program, working, eating, socializing with the teacher and other fluent Yiddish speakers, as well as sitting in class, provides a unique opportunity for Yiddish language acquisition. This project and the others supported by the Naomi Foundation continue her work in a very meaningful way. In addition to all her professional achievements, Nomi always managed to be available in a personal way to her family and friends. When Mark and I got married, yes, Mark Kaplan tonight, speaker, as you know, <laughs> Nomi held one of the chuppah poles. Nomi always enjoyed Mark's erudition in the field of literature. His way through graduate school was a more literary theoretical one, while Nomi and I focused on the cultural side of Yiddish literature. Now Mark has long since received his PhD in comparative literature from New York University and is currently the Zelda and Maya Tandetnik Professor of Yiddish Literature, Language and Culture at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. His first book, How Strange the Change, Language, Temporality and Narrative Form in Peripheral Mosinisms, was published last year. Although tonight's lecture focuses primarily on Yiddish literature, Mark is by nature a comparatist. In his book, he reads Yiddish literature alongside Anglo and Francophone literature from Africa for a better understanding of the role of the, literary, of the literature of minority cultures in the modern world. He thus brings new understandings to Yiddish literature by placing it in a global context, while at the same time bringing Yiddish into the more general literary discourse by using it as a test case in the theoretical model of minor literature that he has developed. He is currently working on Yiddish literature written in, we in Weimar, Germany in the 1920s, another comparative project that draws on contemporaneous German texts. He has published numerous articles in English and in Yiddish, held fellowships in places as diverse as Harvard University and the University of Konstanz in southern Germany, and lectured widely in English and Yiddish, including at the Max Weinreich Center of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, co-sponsor of tonight's lecture. Mark and I met in the world of Yiddish and have always spoken Yiddish to each other. He used to joke that we should apply for a Yiddish language stipend for going out on dates. 
It was thus natural that we should speak Yiddish to our children, Kenahara, and we are lucky enough to be building a small Yiddish-speaking community with a few other families in Baltimore. Usually, when Mark gives a lecture, I'm at home with the kids. So apart from everything else, I'd like to thank the Naomi Foundation for this opportunity to listen to my husband speak with full attention. <laughs> the title of his talk tonight is Watch the Throne, Spectacle and Spectres in the Stories of Reb Nachman and Dernister. evening. Uh, I'd like to begin tonight, first of all, by thanking um, primarily my wife, Brucha, for uh, the lovely uh, introduction and the lovely life. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Kadar Foundation, particularly Dr. Kadar, the Kadar family, the incomparable Lindsay Blank, uh, for making the evening possible, for making this uh, an evening of celebration and joy and learning, which are values that I always associated every time I saw Nomi, and I continue to hold those values very dearly, uh, uh, both in my memory of her and uh, the work that I try to do in her presence. And Achran Achran Hoviv, last but not least, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is uh, a magnificent audience. I'm gratified that I have so many friends in the audience, and I'm also gratified that I have so many people that are not yet my friends, but hopefully by the end of the evening will become so. What I'm going to present to you tonight is very much a work in progress. So uh, I hope that even though the beginning of the evening I'm going to be the one doing most of the talking, which often happens with me, um, I really am interested in your response, your comments, your interactions, so I hope that by the end of the evening this might become more of a conversation. The subject of my remarks this evening, kingship in modern Yiddish literature, is as unlikely as it is ambivalent in its relationship to the Yiddish literary tradition and Jewish history more broadly <laughs> defined. Despite the fact that monarchy was the accepted mode of governance for nearly all the lands in which Jews lived for most of their history, and despite the, let's say, grudging, ambiguous notion within rabbinic thought of a Davidic dynasty constituting an essential prerequisite to the final redemption, Jewish sources are remarkably resistant to the charms and pretensions of courtly life. The primary source for establishing a monarchy over Israel occurs in a Torah passage just recently reviewed, um, week before last, uh, in the reading Shoftim from the book of Deuteronomy. There Moses says to the children of Israel, quote, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around about me, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. Moses, who despises kingship as only someone raised in a palace he grows to reject could, <laughs> suggests that the children of Israel's desire for a king functions as a kind of covetousness, desiring what other people have. And he responds to this wish by suggesting that the ideal king should not amass wealth wives, or horses to himself, but should instead spend his days copying out the law and judging the people. That is, the king should ideally not behave like other kings, but should instead behave exactly as Moses himself has for 40 years in the desert. The legacy of Moses' admonition, as we all know, falls well short of his expectations. The quintessential king in Jewish discourse is King David, an almost Clintonian figure, dare I say, <laughs> of inspired grace and carnal weakness, a poet uniquely positioned to praise God and a politician always prepared to play his own press agent. Glad I'm not going up against Clinton in the Democratic Convention tonight. That's tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> 
I contend that there are only three truly memorable kings in the Bible besides David. Ahab, the prototype for Macbeth, a craven leader far less interesting than his wife Jezebel. Saul, whom David supplants, and Ahasuerus in the book of Esther, perhaps the most prominently depicted and interesting non-Jew in the scriptures. Saul, it can be summarized, is a study in tragic pathos, a figure of Baroque grandeur, better animated in Handel's oratorio than in the book of Samuel where he first appears. Ahasuerus becomes in Jewish folklore a burlesque contrast to Saul, drunken, foolish, ultimately harmless figure, who redeems the Jewish people and facilitates their return to the land of Israel with the same equanimity and obliviousness as he had previously sold their fate to the wicked Haman. Not for nothing does the Bible connect these two viscerally untranscendent characters by making the rescue of the Jews under Ahasuerus dependent on two direct descendants of Saul, Mordecha and Esther. Through this nifty plot twist, the Baroque Trauerspiel, the post-classical tragic drama, and the Purim Carnival function as diametric inversions of one another. Much has been said by scholars better qualified than myself about the subsequent use of monarchical images and motifs in rabbinic thought. As David Stern's exemplary study parables in Midrash suggests, the explicit pattern of reference in Midrash to courtly life in the Roman world of late antiquity serves a subtle and subversive political purpose as much as an exegetical or homiletic function for the biblical passages to which these narratives were addressed. I would love to dwell on the ingenuity and subversiveness of the political critique suggested by the Midrash, but in the interest of time and thematic focus, I will reluctantly skip over this complex and fascinating literature in order to turn our attention now precisely to the early modern world in which the motifs of Saul and Ahasuerus interact, the world of Trauerspiel and Purimspiel. Now, as I said before, Trauerspiel is a German concept, and it refers not to tragedy in the Greek classical sense, but specifically in the Baroque sense, a kind of degraded, tragic world that's characterized primarily by protagonists who are both tyrants and martyrs. Now, this combination doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense, and it's not supposed to make sense because it's in the fracturing of the courtly order. It is in the almost schizophrenic division of the protagonist that the Trauerspiel as a specific genre derives its dramatic energy. The Purimspiel, spoken about succinctly, is a um, kind of folk theater that was performed at the holiday, the carnival holiday of Purim, at which all traditions were burlesqued, turned upside down, made fun of. Um, in fact, in the early 18th century in Germany, when Jews still spoke Yiddish, the Purimspiel was sometimes actually referred to as a Trauerspiel, although the actual content of the Purimspiel was usually pretty, pretty um, shockingly low comedy, but very entertaining stuff, especially, you know, what else did you have to do to amuse yourself, uh, you know. Um, now, the primary insight into the world of the Baroque and the Trauerspiel came to me by way of the German-Jewish philosopher Walter Benjamin's classic study of the Trauerspiel, uh, in which he describes the fundamental dramatic paradox of the genre, as I just mentioned, as the contradiction of a protagonist who is both a tyrant and a, modern, and a martyr. For modern Yiddish literature, a literary culture that begins in the early 19th century. I would suggest that this paradox manifests itself in the stories of Reb Nachman of Breslov. So who is Reb Nachman? Reb Nachman was the great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, the figure around whom the entire Hasidic movement coalesced at the end of the 18th century. Reb Nachman was born in 1772. Uh, he had a distinguished pedigree. He was a child prodigy. He memorized the book of Psalms by the age of eight. And if any of you have ever tried to read any of his uh, 
theological or philosophical works. They are, uh, they are saturated with references to the Kabbalah, to the Talmud, to the Midrash, to the whole library of Jewish learning. He was, in other words, poised at the beginning of his career to galvanize and focus and lead the Hasidic movement, which at the time was only a generation old, into the 19th century. And then something kind of funny happened. He uh, picked a turf war with a rival Rebbe, uh, a Rebbe who was much older than him and actually knew his great-grandfather. Uh, and by the end of his life, Reb Nachman was himself a kind of a um, Baroque figure. Uh, uh, he died at the age of 38 in 1810. He had tuberculosis, which is a terrible way to die. Um, spectacle and specters in the stories of Reb Nachman and Dernister. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to begin tonight, first of all, by thanking um, Primarily, my wife, Brucha, for uh, the lovely uh, introduction and the lovely life. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Kadar Foundation, particularly Dr. Kadar, the Kadar family, the incomparable Lindsay Blank, uh, for making the evening possible, for making this uh, an evening of celebration and joy and learning which are values that I always associated every time I saw Nomi, and I continue to hold those values very dearly, uh, uh, both in my memory of her and uh, the work that I try to do in her presence. And Achran Achran Hoviv, last but not least, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is uh, a magnificent audience. I'm gratified that I have so many friends in the audience, and I'm also gratified that I have so many people that are not yet my friends, but hopefully by the end of the evening will become so. What I'm going to present to you tonight is very much a work in progress. So uh, I hope that even though the beginning of the evening I'm going to be the one doing most of the talking, which often happens with me, um, I really am interested in your response, your comments, your interactions. So I hope that by the end of the evening, this might become more of a conversation. The subject of my remarks this evening, kingship in modern Yiddish literature, is as unlikely as it is ambivalent in its relationship to the Yiddish literary tradition and Jewish history more broadly <laughs> defined. Despite the fact that monarchy was the accepted mode of governance for nearly all the lands in which Jews lived for most of their history, and despite the, let's say, grudging, ambiguous notion within rabbinic thought of a Davidic dynasty constituting an essential prerequisite to the final redemption, Jewish sources are remarkably resistant to the charms and pretensions of courtly life. 
The primary source for establishing a monarchy over Israel occurs in a Torah passage just recently reviewed, um, week before last, uh, in the reading Shoftim from the book of Deuteronomy. There Moses says to the children of Israel, quote, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around about me, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. Moses, who despises kingship as only someone raised in a palace he grows to reject could, suggests that the children of Israel's desire for a king functions as a kind of covetousness, desiring what other people have. And he responds to this wish by suggesting that the ideal king should not amass wealth, wives, or horses to himself, but should instead spend his days copying out the law and judging the people. That is, the king should ideally not behave like other kings, but should instead behave exactly as Moses himself has for 40 years in the desert. The legacy of Moses' admonition, as we all know, falls well short of his expectations. The quintessential king in Jewish discourse is King David, an almost Clintonian figure, dare I say, <laughs> of inspired grace and carnal weakness, a poet uniquely positioned to praise God and a politician always prepared to play his own press agent. Glad I'm not going up against Clinton in the Democratic Convention tonight. That's tomorrow. I would contend that there are only three truly memorable kings in the Bible besides David. Ahab, the prototype for Macbeth, a craven leader far less interesting than his wife Jezebel. Saul, whom David supplants. And Ahasuerus in the book of Esther, perhaps the most prominently depicted and interesting non-Jew in the scriptures. Saul, it can be summarized, is a study in tragic pathos, a figure of Baroque grandeur better animated in Handel's oratorio than in the book of Samuel where he first appears. Ahasuerus becomes in Jewish folklore a burlesque contrast to Saul, drunken, foolish, ultimately harmless figure who redeems the Jewish people and facilitates their return to the land of Israel with the same equanimity and obliviousness as he had previously sold their fate to the wicked Haman. Not for nothing does the Bible connect these two viscerally untranscendent characters by making the rescue of the Jews under Ahasuerus dependent on two direct descendants of Saul, Mordecai and Esther. Through this nifty plot twist, the Baroque Trauerspiel, the post-classical tragic drama, and the Purim Carnival function as diametric inversions of one another. Much has been said by scholars better qualified than myself about the subsequent use of monarchical images and motifs in rabbinic thought. As David Stern's exemplary study Parables in Midrash suggests, the explicit pattern of reference in Midrash to courtly life in the Roman world of late antiquity serves a subtle and subversive political purpose as much as an exegetical or homiletic function for the biblical passages to which these narratives were addressed. I would love to dwell on the ingenuity and subversiveness of the political critique suggested by the Midrash, but in the interest of time and thematic focus, I will reluctantly skip over this complex and fascinating literature in order to turn our attention now precisely to the early modern world in which the motifs of Saul and Ahasuerus interact, the world of Trauerspiel and Purimspiel. Now, as I said before, Trauerspiel is a German concept, and it refers not to tragedy in the Greek classical sense, but specifically in the Baroque sense, a kind of degraded tragic world that's characterized primarily by protagonists who are both tyrants and martyrs. Now, this combination doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense, and it's not supposed to make sense because it's in the fracturing of the courtly order. It is in the almost schizophrenic division of the protagonist that the Trauerspiel as a specific genre derives its dramatic energy. The Purimspiel, spoken about succinctly, is a um, kind of folk theater 
that was performed at the holiday, the carnival holiday of Purim, and which all traditions were burlesqued, turned upside down, made fun of. Um, in fact, in the early 18th century in Germany, when Jews still spoke Yiddish, the Purim spiel was sometimes actually referred to as a Trauerspiel, although the actual content of the Purim spiel was usually pretty, pretty um, shockingly low comedy, but very entertaining stuff, especially, you know, what else did you have to do to amuse yourself, uh, you know. Um, now, the primary insight into the world of the Baroque and the Trauerspiel came to me by way of the German-Jewish philosopher Walter Benjamin's classic study of the Trauerspiel, uh, in which he describes the fundamental dramatic paradox of the genre, as I just mentioned, as the contradiction of a protagonist who is both a tyrant and a, modern, and a martyr. For modern Yiddish literature, a literary culture that begins in the early 19th century, I would suggest that this paradox manifests itself in the stories of Reb Nachman of Breslov. So, who is Reb Nachman? Reb Nachman was the great-grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, the figure around whom the entire Hasidic movement coalesced at the end of the 18th century. Reb Nachman was born in 1772. Uh, he had a distinguished pedigree. He was a child prodigy. He memorized the Book of Psalms by the age of eight. And if any of you have ever tried to read any of his uh, theological or philosophical works, they are, uh, they are saturated with references to the Kabbalah, to the Talmud, to the Midrash, to the whole library of Jewish learning. He was, in other words, poised at the beginning of his career to galvanize and focus and lead the Hasidic movement, which at the time was only a generation old, into the 19th century. And then something kind of funny happened. He... Uh, picked a turf war with a rival Rebbe, uh, a Rebbe who was much older than him and actually knew his great-grandfather. Uh, and by the end of his life, Reb Nachman was himself a kind of a um, Baroque figure. Uh, uh, he died at the age of 38 in 1810. He had tuberculosis, which is a terrible way to die. Um, not that the others are so much better, but... Um, uh, and he was reviled in the Hasidic world. Now, a couple of years ago, I made an annual pilgrimage uh, at Rosh Hashanah to the town of Uman in the Ukraine, where Reb Nachman uh, was buried. Um, and every Rosh Hashanah, 20,000 Hasidim uh, gather in Uman to celebrate Reb Nachman's legacy. And when I say Hasidim, I don't mean specifically the Hasidim of Reb Nachman. I mean... Uh, uh, people from across the Orthodox spectrum, 20,000 people, all of the men from Israel, from America, from all over the world, speaking Yiddish, speaking Hebrew, speaking French, speaking English, um, Orthodox yeshiva types, uh, rival Hasidim, Yemenite Jews, Ethiopian Jews, curious Jews. Um, we were all there. And what the uh, presence of so many people dedicated on this one weekend to this one figure illustrates to me is the fact that Reb Nachman's currency, his significance, his importance, his celebrity in modern Jewish thought has never been higher than it is today. And when one thinks of him today as one of the central theologians, one of the central thinkers, one of the central poets of the Jewish tradition in the modern era, um, we have to remind ourselves that 200 years ago, he was a dangerous person. He was a figure of contention and conflict. Like all great modernists, Reb Nachman's most experimental work created a riot among the audience to which it was addressed, a phenomenon almost impossible to imagine in our own ostensibly enlightened era, of what Herbert Marcuse once referred to very problematically as repressive tolerance. Without wishing to sign on to all the attributes of Marcuse's theory, uh, one might nonetheless express a certain dubious nostalgia toward an era when ideas mattered enough to fight over. And Reb Nachman's ideas certainly seemed worth fighting over when he first appeared on the horizon of early Hasidic culture. I would like to propose this evening that the affinities between Reb Nachman's stories, and Reb Nachman's stories were told in his lifetime, 
He never wrote the stories down himself. His disciples wrote them down. And in fact, everything that we read under the authorship of Reb Nachman of Breslov was actually written down by somebody else. It's a kind of unique structure of Hasidic writing. But uh, he told a series of stories in the last years of his life that were collected after his death. They were published in a bilingual edition of Hebrew and Yiddish. This is the only one of the original masterworks of Hasidic thought that was in its origin published bilingually, published in Yiddish and Hebrew in the same volume. But obviously, Reb Nachman meant something very significant about having them published in Yiddish as well as Hebrew, unlike the many multitude of volumes that he published on other subjects. But I would like to propose this evening that the affinities between Reb Nachman's stories and the world of the European Baroque are not only formal, but perhaps temporal as well, not just historical, but in Reb Nachman's experience of time. Reb Nachman's stories are indeed the first original fictional narratives to appear in Yiddish after a hiatus initiated with the Chmelnitsky massacres of 150 years earlier. That is, in the mid-17th century, the heyday of the European Baroque. In this respect, Reb Nachman occupies a space that is unique in Yiddish literature, but one that is uncannily, perhaps spectrally, close to its natural habitat in the world of a traditional Jewish culture abruptly opening up to modernity. Reb Nachman's stories dispense with the shtetl, the cheder, the yeshiva, the marketplace, the arranged marriage, all of the trappings that we associate with classic Yiddish literature. Though we know of Reb Nachman as a profound and original religious thinker, both the homiletic purpose and the frame of reference to traditional Jewish stories remain elusive, intangible in most of his narratives. And yet, the implications of Jewishness in the newly modern world remain as animating a preoccupation for him as they do for modern Jewish writers such as Sholem Aleichem, Mendel Amoychasforim, Y.L. Peretz, or Shen Yod Agnon. As much as Reb Nachman strove purposely to reorder and disorder the logic of European folklore, his stories perform a similar task of subversion and sublimation with respect to the expectations of what a Jewish story might be. As Reb Nachman described his aesthetic project, distinct though related to his larger theological project, quote, in the tales which other people tell, this means non-Jews, in the tales which other peoples tell, there are many secrets and lofty matters, but the tales have been ruined in that they are lacking much. They are confused and not told in the proper sequence. What belongs at the beginning, they tell at the end and vice versa. Reb Nachman's solution to this ostensible narratological problem seems less to repair the stories of the nations of the world than to fracture them further out of all structural or generic recognition. As the German-Jewish philosopher Theodor Adorno suggests of Reb Nachman's close contemporary Ludwig von Beethoven, quote, something in his genius, Beethoven's genius, probably the deepest thing, refused to reconcile in the image what is unreconciled in reality. And this, too, we might say is a, a, a statement that applies to Reb Nachman's storytelling. Although these are almost the only Yiddish narratives for which the categories of the Baroque, the Gothic, or even the surreal might be invoked without irony or quotation marks. Their achievement radiates darkly, like an X-ray, illuminating both the aesthetic logic of Yiddish modernism and its subterranean structural affinities to larger developments within modern literature. What these stories embody of a small, closed narrative form opening itself up to the grand narrative gestures of modernist critique is precisely what the classical shtetl satire dramatizes about the encounter, its dangers and its discontents, of closed Jewish spaces with the wider world. For Reb Nachman, storytelling, as my teacher David Roskies has richly suggested, is a response to crisis, both personally and in the larger culture of the 19th century. This crisis was as much a problem of narration, representation, and idiom as it was of culture or politics. As Yiddish came to be concentrated over the course of the 18th century more and more exclusively in Eastern Europe, 
The old genres of interpolation and mediation function less and less as vehicles of expression. New forms are idioms, particularly in linguistic terms, the use of Eastern Yiddish over the antiqu antiquated Western norms that had prevailed in Yiddish writing before, a topic brilliantly expressed in Dov Kehler's uh, uh, monograph, had yet to appear. The Reb Nachman is the first storyteller to step into a new fictional universe. At a distance, he appears to follow the cues of the older interpolated genres. But the manifestations he presents are unlike anything seen before in Jewish narrative, and though much imitated, not quite like anything seen since. Although Dan Nister and his contemporary Shen Yod Agnon come closest in distinctive respects. Though conventional exegesis, both in the academic world and in the Hasidic context, typically read Reb Nachman's stories as allegories. They function as such only in the sense that Walter Benjamin suggests in his study of Baroque tragedy. And this is what Benjamin says, quote, allegories are in the realm of thought what ruins are in the realm of things. For Benjamin, allegory connects with a philosophy of history via the status of the object. Benjamin makes of allegories not mere ruins, but relics. This is the significance of allegory to his understanding of the Baroque. It denotes the proto-modernity of the Baroque by containing, representing, designating that which modernity will abandon or supersede. The allegory is a rationalizing st strategy for containing the instability and ambiguity of metaphor. It is, the it is the rhetorical inverse of the fantastic, which insists on the erasure of distance between literal and figurative meanings. Allegory makes of language an object, which allows language to be represented visually. But in this representation, the allegory becomes simultaneously literal and figurative. As an object, the allegory signifies the mythical potential of speech that modernity as a social, psychological, rhetorical construct must regulate and suppress. Allegory is mythical and it isn't. It is a reification of what myth is in that it takes the place of what myth does. And in this instantaneous transformative process, the Midas alchemy of turning an animate concept into a gilded symbol, the Baroque comes into being. Allegory is therefore exactly the opposite of what it claims to be. Its masquerade is another feature of its characteristically quintessentially Baroque character. Allegory as a representational strategy is always inadequate to the task of signification and as such can only hold attraction to the melancholic who can only be attracted to obsolescent vessels and defunct vehicles. What better description of Benjamin's project can there be than that? What I want to suggest is that this is also precisely the attraction that allegory holds for Reb Nachman as well. It is with these characteristics in mind that I wish to consider Reb Nachman's seventh story. As I said, he published 13 posthumously. This is the seventh. Mizvu Akovish, about a fly and a spider. This story, originally narrated on August the 1st, 1807, is the first story told after Reb Nachman realized that he was dying of tuberculosis. And he did indeed die about three years later. And as such marks the beginning of the second half of his collection of 13 tales. It begins by describing a journey. Quote, I will tell you about the journey I took. Its homiletical portent, however, dissipates in the subsequent sentence. When Reb Nachman states, perhaps you think that if I tell you everything, you'll be able to understand. Such optimism, Reb Nachman suggests, is premature. Instead of offering his audience the travelogue of a physical journey, he speaks metaphysically, metaphorically, of a king who fought many wars. He conquered every enemy and he celebrated his victories with an annual ball at his palace. The centerpiece of the festivities was a comic performance in which the customs of every nation were mocked, even the Turks, and they probably mocked the Jews as well. 
By way of ethnographic verisimilitude, the king keeps a book in which all the customs of the world's peoples are inscribed. One day the king is sitting with this book when he notices a spider creeping along its pages in pursuit of a fly. Every time the spider comes within striking distance of the fly, a wind would blow, causing a page of the book to fold over the spider, separating it from its quarry. Finally trapped without escape beneath this page, the spider disappears entirely. Quote, and regarding the fly, I won't tell you what happened to it. Deeply disturbed by what he has witnessed, the king falls asleep over the book and dreams that he holds a diamond in his hand. From this diamond, a myriad people emerge, and the king throws the diamond away. The king's portrait hangs over his throne, quote, as is the accepted practice among kings, states Reb Nachman, the, anthropolo the anthropologist. And on the portrait of the king hangs his crown. The people who emerge from the diamond behead the king's portrait and throw his crown in the mud. They then attempt to assassinate him, but he protects himself like the fly with the page of a book. Still dreaming, the king wants to find out which nation's customs is inscribed on the page that protects him. But he's afraid to look and cries out in his sleep. He dreams further that a high mountain comes to him and asks, Why do you shout so? I've been asleep for so long that no one could wake me, but you of all people have awoken me? The mountain tells the king that the same page that protects the mountain from people who would climb it with impunity also protects the king himself. Learning this, the king dreams that the people who had come out of the diamond to rebel against him now repair his portrait and restore the crown to its proper resting place. With this act of restoration, simultaneously aesthetic and political, the king wakes up. He immediately looks to see which page had protected the fly, and it pr proves to be the page that describes the customs of the Jews. Deciding to convert to Judaism the king undertakes a journey, like the narrator of this story, in search of a wise man to interpret his dream. During his travels, the king takes two assistants and disguises himself as an ordinary person, apparently as Reb Nachman himself had in his search for a medical treatment during the spring and summer of 1807. Finding the wise man, the king reveals himself and tells a story. The wise man prepares a mixture of drugs for the king to smoke so that the truth will be revealed to him in a narcotic vision. <laughs> I, just, I don't write this stuff, folks. I just read it. <laughs> Upon smoking this psychedelic mixture, the king witnesses the cosmic events that occurred at the time of his conception. When he was about to be born, his soul was paraded through the heavenly hosts, who are asked to identify the soul's defects. When no one could speak ill of him, the evil one shouted, Lord of the universe, listen to my plea. If this soul will descend to the physical world, what will I do with myself? Why was I even born? It is decreed nonetheless that the soul will be born and the devil will have to take care of himself. Upon reaching the last station, the heavenly tribunal before being born, the, the soul is intercepted by a messenger of the devil, an old and feeble man. At this point, the king realizes why he was born a non-Jewish king instead of a Jewish holy man, why he fought so many wars and captured so many prisoners. So we're about to find out the big secret, and Reb Nachman is going to tell us what this story means. And what he says is, quote, and more than this he didn't tell. And there is furthermore much in all of this. And the part about the prisoners at the end is not transcribed exactly as he told it. Nachman! <laughs> now, what sort of allegory does Reb Nachman create in the story of a spider and a fly? I would identify three principal components to this narrative, each of which Reb Nachman renders elliptically to an unusual degree even for him. The first describes the king's custom of throwing balls to celebrate his military vic victories, culminating in the chase of the spider and the fly. The second is the king's dream, culminating in his dialogue with the mountain. The third describes the journey promised at the story's preamble in search of an interpretation of the king's dream. 
The interpretation, however, is not forthcoming, and indeed the story ends, as is progressively typical of Reb Nachman's stories, with an ad admonition against analysis as such. In the absence of interpretation, we are left with the structure of the story itself. In this respect, each of the three components in the story signifies a different storytelling genre. In the broken allegory of the spider and the fly, Reb Nachman offers a belated, perhaps parodic, version of the Baroque. At the end, when the king's cosmic heritage is revealed to be Jewish, the story resembles contemporaneous conventions of the Gothic, which hinge typically on the revelation of a secret paternity in a closed space, a castle, a monastery, or a convent. Reb Nachman, by anticipating the Gothic novel in a story of maybe five pages, makes explicit what the genre's preoccupation with closed spaces opening up to horrified revelations signifies, the process of internalization essential to the psychology of modernity in an era only about a generation before the concept of, psycholo of psychology had been formulated. This process of internalization is sublimated into the spatiality of the Gothic novel, whereas for Reb Nachman, this process becomes explicit through the psychic journey that the king undertakes, a journey in turn reenacted by the storyteller with his audience. Moving from the Trauerspiel and also the Purimspiel of the first section to the anticipatory Gothic of the third obligates the quest narrative of the second section, a motif Reb Nachman re reconfigures for Jewish narrative from the Yiddish adaptations of medieval romance that had constituted the most familiar source of entertainment and folklore among his original audience. In the quest, turned inward into a search for self-awareness and consciousness, Reb Nachman negotiates a turn from the psychic and spatial world of the 17th century directly into the functions of the 19th century, a consequence simultaneously of his radical experimentation with narrative form and the compressed, propulsive historical context in which he lived. Thus, in this elliptical trauerspiel, the king is hunted and hunter, tyrant and potential martyr. His courtiers are both servants and assassins. The only route of escape is through dreams, but in dreams, too, the complex repeats itself, only with the difference here that the, signific that the significations regroup into a cosmic drama that cannot be completed, not merely because the completion itself suggests heresy, but also, as Arthur Green has observed, because the irresolution of the story stands as a challenge to Nachman's own Hasidim, a challenge to recognize the falseness of all conclusions. The story is finally a rejection of all explanations that fail to expand the ever-widening gyre of ambivalence that Reb Nachman sets into motion through the ever-dynamic act of narration itself. The story of the spider and the fly is simultaneously a story about two animals and a story about persecution of the king himself. The king is simultaneously an animal, both spider and fly, and a victim of his own courtly machinations. In its fragmentary references and literary structure, moreover, the story of the spider and the fly goes beyond the conflict of power and desire to approach the limits of the conflict between speech and silence, between what must be declared and what it is forbidden to reveal. The question, therefore, remains as to what Reb Nachman would reveal in this story and why he is unable to do so completely. Equally central is the compulsion among his Hasidim towards self-censorship, their refusal to transcribe even the elliptical rendition of the story that the Rebbe is willing to provide. This mystery can be clarified provisionally by considering the role of concealment generally in Reb Nachman's thought and self-image. As Joseph Weiss writes, quote, the hidden Sadiq remains in his paradoxical situation, a misunderstood and therefore even persecuted man, until the day he breaks and his true character can be revealed within the framework of the all-inclusive messianic revelation. During the period of concealment, he kept hidden his most important characteristic, Nachman's secret messianic nature. Stated directly, therefore, the secret at the limits of silence and speech, the desire that dare not speak its name, is the evident heresy that Reb Nachman himself might be the Messiah. At this point, the story becomes hermetic, and the interpretation here differs little from conventional homiletic exegesis. 
The king is Reb Nachman, the messianic destiny ostensibly reserved for this character signifies the actual spiritual status of its creator. The Rebbe's Hasidim, furthermore, are simultaneously the king's loyal courtiers and the myriad people that conspire against him, smiling in his face and stabbing him in the back. In this sense, the Hasidim are loyal courtiers insofar as they recognize Reb Nachman's kingship, his messianic status. But they are treacherous in their refusal to act on this recognition, either because of their self-censorship or their failure to live up to his ideals. An inevitable failure in an unredeemed world, a failure of which Reb Nachman, as the Messiah, would be equally culpable. It is therefore entirely appropriate that Reb Nachman begins and ends this tale with a warning against interpretation. Taking the story to the limits of its, of its implications would not only be heresy, it would threaten to undo forever the relationship between the Rebbe and his Hasidim, and in so doing would undermine the only communal structure, the only tangible hope for redemption that the Hasidic movement can hope to offer for Jews on earth. This, in other words, is a failed story, the failure of which is redeemed when the reader understands that it is a story about failure, Reb Nachman's failure as a putative messiah. But this failure is, at the same time, the event that saves Reb Nachman and his movement from heresy. Reb Nachman offers further evidence for the autobiographical character of this narrative when he describes the final trial of the king's soul in the heavenly tribunal before his birth. Speaking for the prosecution, the devil is an old and feeble man. Now, both Hasidic and academic commentators concur that the man referred to here is Reb Arya Leib of Shpola, who lived from 1725 to 1812, the Hasidic leader whom uh, Reb Nachman picked a fight with at the beginning of his career, a venerable wise man known as the grandfather of Shpola, the Shpola Zayde. The Shpola Zayde was Reb Nachman's primary opponent during the last 10 years of Reb Nachman's life, essentially for the entire, in the entirety of Reb Nachman's career as a Rebbe. At this point, therefore, the story becomes not just a metaphysical allegory about Reb Nachman's frustrated messianic ambitions, but also a political satire about the fate of the Hasidic movement. If the king who fights many wars is indeed Reb Nachman, then the empire over which he attempts to exert his authority is the Hasidic movement itself. It is thus of critical significance to consider the revelation in the story of the spider and the fly that the royal protagonist was meant to be born a Jew, but through the machinations of the devil, represented apparently by the Shpola Zeta, entered the world merely as a non-Jewish king. In simultaneously political and metaphysical terms, Reb Nachman is stating here, with apparent explicitness, that the real drama of human creation is to be fought out over the meaning and practice of Judaism. A Jew, therefore, would automatically command a higher cosmological status than even the most powerful non-Jew in the world. This is a startling political assertion, given the actual position of Jews in Eastern European society during Reb Nachman's day. The story acknowledges how unlikely this assertion is through the catalytic motif of the ball at which the various cultures of the world, except presumably the king's own, are mocked. Without this indulgence in ethnic humor, the king could never have learned of his supernatural connection with the Jewish people. In an era or a regime that mocks and diminishes all ethnicities without discrimination, Reb Nachman makes a case not only for the specific mystical properties of the Jewish people, but perhaps also the value of ethnic difference per se. Moreover, the Jews in this story are related metonymically to the fly. The fly seeks protection under the page that describes, signifies, and parodies their culture. Like the fly, the Jews are small, hunted, and despised, yet they triumph over their persecutors in the as yet unrevealed end. The political metaphysics of this story, unfortunately, undermine whatever homiletic unity the exegete could hope to impose. For if the king was meant to be born the Messiah, but instead was born a non-Jewish aristocrat, then he cannot symbolize Reb Nachman, who may have been meant to be the Messiah, but certainly was not a non-Jew nor an, an aristocrat, except in the ineluctably Jewish world of Hasidism. Moreover, if Reb Nachman depicts himself in the story as a non-Jewish king, why is the Shpola Zeta, whose power over non-Jewish monarchs was marginal at best, invoked without comparable metaphorical trappings? 
Instead of a parable about Reb Nachman as king or the king as Messiah, a story of a spider and a fly can more accurately be described as an assemblage in which kings and wise men, to say nothing of courtiers and assassins or spiders and flies, each appear as metaphors in a private struggle between Reb Nachman's messianic desires and the repressive threat of heresy. Indeed, one can say that in the deliberately bizarre contours of this story, Reb Nachman has found the ideal structure for describing heresy itself. The story is structurally incoherent, precisely to the extent that heresy undermines the theological coherence of the world. And if the, the inconvenient factors considered in this discussion destroy the exegetical unity of this relentlessly diffuse narrative, they nonetheless acknowledge the contradictory impulses that more conventional readings shortchange. In just this respect, the allegories that Reb Nachman suggests are dislodged from conventional hermeneutics. The images are neither original nor adapted, but somehow, as he advertises in his project of subversive reconstruction, corrupted. They function not as moral lessons and certainly not as folklore, but as icons stranded in their status between tableau vivant and nature mort a fitting tension given the means of their composition between oral storytelling and written narration, as well as their linguistic status as bilingual texts in sanctified Lushan Kaidish and vernacular Yiddish. Now, having considered Reb Nachman in a previous context as an anticipatory modernist, by reading his tales belatedly against the Baroque, one can at last specify what strain of modernist aesthetics Reb Nachman is actually anticipating. The symbolism of Der Nister. Because like Reb Nachman, symbolism presents itself as an allegory lacking an external referent. A signifier relating not to an external signified, since for the symbolist artist nothing exists outside the mind, a praxis of Hegelian philosophy and the logic of modernity driven to parodic extremes. This perhaps explains the affinity of symbolist poetics with structuralist analysis, since symbolism properly understood constitutes itself as a series of signifiers signifying only themselves. Now, if this were a properly comparative discussion, as I never tire of uh, reminding my students, I would have introduced Der Nister earlier in my remarks so that his points of contrast and complementarity might better inform our understanding of Reb Nachman and vice versa. This evening, however, I'm attempting to develop a different kind of argument about the historical development of an aesthetic phenomenon. So how Der Nister relates to Reb Nachman's stories is less urgent in this context than how his writing picks up where Reb Nachman's stories leave off. How they incorporate both Reb Nachman's refraction of Baroque aesthetics as well as later trends of the Gothic imagination, romanticism, symbolism, and other avant-garde literary techniques. Before considering these questions, however, it might be necessary to introduce Denister himself. Since although I characterize Reb Nachman as a religious thinker who today is known, if not always understood, by nearly every Jewish audience, Denister is a figure who is known by next to no one. And in a strangely apt way, this is just as he intended. Like virtually every Yiddish writer of the modern era, Denister, his mother called him Pinchas Kahanovich, was born in the Russian Pale of Settlement in 1884 in the large commercial town of Berdichev in the Ukraine and received a private traditional education in classical rabbinic texts before falling under the spell of modern Hebrew and Russian literature during his adolescence. It is noteworthy, moreover, that Denister's older brother Aaron became a follower of Reb Nachman, a Breslov or Chassid, while his younger brother Max became a sculptor and art dealer in Paris. Denister's vocation as a Yiddish modernist fails, falls somewhere between the poles of traditional piety and modern cosmopolitanism occupied by his brothers. After unsuccessfully beginning his literary career as a Hebrew poet, a gesture again typical of virtually all the Yiddish writers in his generation, Denister settled on the medium of Yiddish fiction as well as the provocative Kabbalistic pseudonym, The Hidden One, Denister, in 1907. For the next 20 years, Denister was the leading author of symbolist fiction in Yiddish literature. Upon returning to the Soviet Union from a period of exile in Germany at the end of the 1920s, however, he was obligated to conform to the emerging aesthetic mandates of social realism. 
After struggling over the course of the 1930s to refigure his writing in accordance with the party line, he managed to produce the major achievement in Yiddish socialist realism, the grand historical novel, The Mishpacha Mashper, The Family Mashper, as its excellent English translation is titled. During World War II, Den Nister was prominent in the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, and as a reward for his valiant service to the Soviet Union, Stalin ordered his arrest, torture, and murder in 1950. <laughs> Rather than dwell on the nightmare of history that Den Nister's life exemplifies, and that his writing in the first half of his career was dedicated to overcoming, let's focus this evening on the expressive potential and formal complexity of his early stories. In this respect, then, how does Reb Nachman provide a model for understanding the semiotics of Den Nister's avant-garde stories? And I actually prefer referring to them as avant-garde rather than symbolist because symbolism is always only one element of his aesthetic. There's also an increasingly dominant expressionist motif, as well as the influence of the literary fairy tale, as well as echoes that I've been suggesting of the Baroque and latterly the Gothic. As I'd like to explain in further detail as I continue to develop this argument, I think that if one can understand through Reb Nachman's belated Baroque that the Baroque and the Gothic stand as stylistic inversions of one another, then one can understand a similar dynamic through the analogously belated example of Der Nister, whose symbolism supposedly was passe already before he began working in the aesthetic, that symbolism stands on the opposite side of the same fence as surrealism, and thus Der Nister stands at the crossroads of a global modernist aesthetic. We see in one of the preeminent achievements in Der Nister's avant-garde pe period, a bova maisa, or the ramaisa mit di malachem, uh, uh, a story about bova or a story with kings, written in 1920, the extent to which the author takes his cues in both style and tone from Reb Nachman's story of the spider and the fly, along with the prototypical pre-modern Yiddish romance, Das Bova Buch, from which the colloquial expression Baba Maisa, Old Wives' Tale, originally derives. Where the Bava Buch of the Renaissance, however, Judaizes several aspects of the medieval chivalric tale in order to neutralize the danger of importing a foreign narrative into a still traditional, though dynamic, culture, Dan Nister divests his writing of essentially all overt references to Judaism, except for the Yiddish language itself. The term nister means hidden one, and the Jewish significance of his writing, therefore, isn't absent, but concealed, just beneath the surface, and requiring the revelation of a sensitive and culturally attuned audience. Like Reb Nachman, Den Nister offers homiletically opaque parables to devotees and adepts, willing to devote their lives to decipher them. Unlike Reb Nachman, Den Nister never actually recruited any Hasidim to the task. Nonetheless, the close, intense affinity between Der Nister's writing with the precedence of the Bova Buch and Reb Nachman's stories indicates that like all great modernists, Reb Nachman included, an agonistic sense of the past, tradition, and memory animates Der Nister's imagination on what can only be described as the subconscious level, where history is one of the rational discourses that signifies and constitutes modernity. The internalization of the past as a spectral, unspeakable presence characterizes modernism in all its manifestations. As in Reb Nachman's story, Dan Nister brings the reader into a world where characters and actions are at once overly familiar, but also torn from their expected functions. A world neither fantastic nor realistic, but somehow functioning parallel or perhaps inverted from the conventions of logic, history, and narrative form. Quote, once there was a king king like any king with a crown on his head and a throne to sit on, and all the qualities and everything that pertains to a king. One day the king fell ill, and this is what was wrong with him. He trembled for his crown and his throne. He no longer believed in his kingdom or his people, nor did he trust his lords in near and dear. Every night he would dream of poisons and swords, plots and uprisings, revolts and upheavals. Always, every time he slept, he would see wild and terrifying visions that made him go cold and go hot. He would wake up in the midst of them and never sleep a full night or full sleep. 
So just two years after a world war that had brought an end to at least three monarchies, a Yiddish writer is depicting precisely the situation which called the Baroque Tower Spiel into being. Yet he does so not as an expression of the Baroque poet's horror at a world that had lost its old divinely sanctioned order. The regicide that he depicts, like Reb Nachman, speaks to something internal. It is the king's own subconscious that seems to betray him, making of the imagined plot a prospect perhaps as much desired as feared. If the solution that Danister offers to the broken world of the king's consciousness is storytelling, it does not seek to repair the world, a task Reb Nachman's stories had resisted from a theological perspective over a century earlier, so much as to bypass the world. At a moment when seemingly every other writer in Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, cultivated an aesthetic of expressionism, Danister reached back to a cultivation of the archaic, and the pristine, not as a program for remaking the future in the image of an idealized past. Kings and knights, after all, uh, and enchanted forests, plainly, belong no more to the Jewish experience in Danister's day than they did in the era of the original Bava Misa, but instead as a path of continuous escape. The fairy tale for Danister, like Reb Nachman, serves as a weapon to subvert everyday reality, not to transform it. The performance artist Laurie Anderson describes once watching someone, a Polynesian king in fact, using a disposable camera, taking picture after picture, but forgetting to advance the frame. So that instead of a series of photos, he was really just taking one very complicated picture <laughs> of successive images superimposed on one another. This is the effect of Danister's storytelling technique in the Bava Misa. A wanderer comes to the palace of a morbid king to tell him the story of a wanderer named Bava betrothed to another king's daughter. And when the daughter grows ill and approaches death, he goes wandering in search of a cure and encounters another wanderer who had formerly served a king whose son had been struck with a debilitating madness by a beggar emerging from the lake in the royal garden. In a dream, Bova encounters one of his mentors, a stargazer, who instructs him on how to approach the prince in order to cure him. Quote, and the stargazer held in his hand the star stone that he had given Bova to take on his journey, and he held it up. And then a nursery appeared to Bova's eyes, a nursery in a royal palace, and it was still and hung with drapes, and a glow came in through the windows, a quiet evening glow, as if for a quiet patient. It was even now indeed, and a bed appeared by a wall with bedding white and clean and tidy, and on the bed lay covered with a blanket a young boy, tender and frail, a prince with open eyes staring into the room, bulging and big and senseless. And as the king sat there in stillness, the stargazer took the stone in his hand and approached the foot of the bed and stood before the prince's open eyes and put the star stone before his motionless stare and held it for a spell." In Danister's aesthetic, there is no fixed distinction between dreaming and waking reality. And like his contemporary Sigmund Freud, he suggests that storytelling serves as a bridge between these levels of consciousness, but one that doesn't negotiate their differences so much as erase them. Unlike Reb Nachman's story of the spider and the fly, which resists literary structure by assembling itself as a sequence of fragments, each story within the Bava Misa resembles all the others so closely that they blur into one another, like a work of minimalist music structured not out of melody but resonances that are swallowed by an infinite echo. And like minimalist music, Demnister's writing can exert on his readers the sensation that time is standing still. Unlike the immediacy of Reb Nachman's storytelling voice, still present in the written transcriptions of his narratives and, and really all of his writings, then Nister's work derives energy from a labyrinth of deferral, delay, and digression. In structural terms, therefore, Reb Nachman's story and then Nister's writing are not only illustrations of fundamental distinctions between oral and written narratives, they are also inverted examples of particular narrative techniques. In the Bava Meister, in the Bava Misa, beggars and kings are constantly reversing position with one another, exactly as Reb Nachman's king hovers structurally between the position of spider and fly. 
And these schematic reversals suggest a structure of power and desire in a constant state of mutual deconstruction and decomposition. The kings in Dynistus' story, as in Reb Nachman's, are curiously passive and powerless. They have the authority to enforce capricious rules governing their own narrow domains. But it is the beggars in the story who can see the future, relieve affliction, transport themselves through walls, and command the stars. When Baba brings a king's stillborn child to life, he refuses all the rewards that the king offers him. I don't need any presents, and I don't require anything. For what does a beggar want, after all? Of course, the beggar desires nothing, at least not in the purely metaphysical world of Dernister's story. This reversal of expectation in context is itself evidence of what is being depicted here is not monarchy as a political ideal. If Shakespeare's Henry IV says, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown, both Reb Nachman and Der Nister make the crown so heavy that it renders its wearer immobile and more than a little ridiculous. The cosmic audacity of Reb Nachman's claims regarding the Jews, their superiority to even non-Jewish kings, and their potential to redeem the world here recur in a sublimated fashion among knights, beggars, and wanderers. The figures originally Judaized in the Renaissance Bova book and the same prototypes for Reb Nachman's stories. With respect to his storytelling motifs, therefore, the Nister, like Reb Nachman, inhabits a unique position in Jewish literature between the non-Jewish world of folkloric motifs from which he adapts his stories and belief in the exceptionality of Jewish difference, perhaps identifiable in this instance only by the choice of language in his writing, that animates the moral and narrative logic of his writing. Both writers bear more than a passing resemblance as well to Franz Kafka. And although recent efforts to connect Reb Nachman to Kafka have done little to increase our understanding of either writer or their respective connection to Jewishness, one is struck by how closely Der Nister's Bovemeisse resembles Kafka's Der Prozess, the trial. As when Der Nister writes, probably in direct allusion to Reb Nachman's first story, quote, And Bova came to the capital, and he met no guards at the gates, and the gates were standing ajar, and no one guarded the entrance or his entrance. Bubba was astounded. He couldn't understand the guards, and he wondered about their negligence and their unwatchfulness, for he wasn't used to finding a royal city unguarded thus. But he did find it thus, and he saw no one to talk about it, so he didn't ask. And he stepped across the threshold and through the gates, and thus, undisturbed and not stopped by anyone, he came into the capital and into its streets. In Kafka's parable, Before the Law, first published in a German-language Zionist journal in 1915. Each person apparently has a gate leading to the judgment and to justice, but this gate is blocked by one and possibly by 50 guards, each more fearsome than the previous. For Der Nister, by contrast, the gate and the whole city have been abandoned, open, and exposed. Whatever the law might signify for Kafka, who, of course, was a lawyer, it is in his writing too foreboding and immense even to be approached, and as such remains inscrutable, ineffable, and immense. For Der Nister, a similar structure is abandoned, desolate, and empty, but no less mysterious. Is this a distinction between a German Jew's reaction to a tradition and a concept of justice too remote to be apprehended, in contrast to a child of Hasidic Jews who experienced not only his own partially complete secularization, but also the collapse of the whole social order built around that same tradition? Reducing either of these writers to such a one-dimensional reading deprives them of their artistic agency as well as the complexity of their cultural and narrative achievement. Nonetheless, their use of a common dramatic predicament and spatial structuring, without a doubt arrived independently of one another, suggests an affinity not constructed from an arbitrary position of ethnic determinism, but out of an aesthetic connection. Their dramatic deployment of space itself, a curiously depeopled landscape, the guard at the gate and before the law is not so much a human character as an embodiment of the gate's own obstructionist function is a redeployment of Baroque and Gothic motifs within the poetics of modernism. The structures of law, wisdom, and power that the Enlightenment had promised would be universal, accessible, and rational for each of these writers has become palimpsests, ruins, and snares. <laughs> 
or seen in a different way, before the law functions in the trial as an endpoint, beyond which the protagonist has no choice but to submit to the fatal judgment of its secret courts. The unguarded city that Bova enters by contrast provides him with another avenue for his journeying and another story through which the author can continue spinning his tale. Indeed, Danister's Bava Misa distinguishes itself from Kafka's novel, as well as Reb Nachman's tale of the spider and the fly, not only by its ability to reach an eventual conclusion, but a happy one at that, the return of the beggar knight Bova to his kingdom and his princess, whom he weds in the final paragraph of the story. One might say that this happy ending is perhaps the most authentically secular gesture in all of Der Nister's writing, because unlike Reb Nachman's stories, Der Nister's story represents salvation in this world in real time. And yet, as much as he offers a rectification for Reb Nachman's broken stories and fragmented theology, he too is unable to remain content with the graven image he has carved. What subsequently upsets the delicate equilibrium of narrative form at work in his Bava Misa is the presence of the crowd that must of necessity bear witness to courtly spectacle. Once again, the Baroque aesthetic not only disrupts the harmony of Der Nister's narrative logic, it also rescues the narrative, though not unfortunately its author, from the false comforts of a fictive salvation. As Danister continues to write stories in his avant-garde period, the crowd, the collective, the mass increasingly fills the narrative void with its disruptive presence. These stories illustrate a visceral consequence of allegory as a rhetorical strategy. When the hermetic facade of the allegory cracks, as according to the logic of the Baroque it inevitably must, what rushes into the gap is the wider world and its discontents. This increasingly preoccupies the stories, of Der the stories that Der Nister writes during the decade of the 1920s. The disruption of pure form for Der Nister initiates a new phase of his literary modernism and for his audience, a separate, though closely related, consideration and discussion. Thank you. Now is the time when we dance. <laughs> if, if, if there are questions or comments, they would be very appreciated. So the question is, was Den Nister widely read? Uh, the answer is a definitive no. He was uh, uh, a very obscure figure in his lifetime, and probably one of the primary incentives for him to return to the Soviet Union was the promise of a readership, because the Soviet Union, in the early years of its regime, supported Yiddish writing quite extensively, with schools, with universities, with textbooks, with all sorts of material advantages to bring Yiddish writers back to the old home. Um, but it is remarkable. Uh, I think that there was one review of Der Nister's writing published uh, during his avant-garde period. And that was, a, and, 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 and the guy didn't get it. So he was, you know, he was as obscure in his day as Reb Nachman was 200 years ago. The difference is 200, 200 years later, Reb Nachman is a superstar, and maybe 100 years from now we can reconvene and talk about Der Nister the superstar. Is Der Nister the Rebbe? It's a good question. Um, I think that the answer is complicated. I think that to a certain degree, a symbolist writer wants to use art as a substitute for religion. But the historical reality is that Der Nister lived as a secular Jew, or, I mean, you know, that's a contradiction in terms, but nonetheless, he was not a religious Jew, he did not have disciples, he did not, he was a guy that even people who were friends of his described as living on the margins of whatever group was, uh, was around. He was well respected by people who knew him, he didn't talk a lot, he smoked a lot, um, but he was, you know, he was neither a religious person nor interested in any leadership role whatsoever. So only in the symbolic sense that art is a religion and he is the high priest in a cult of art could one call him that. One can't call him that in any other respect. 
so the question is, how is, Reb Nachman, how is Reb Nachman historically better known as a religious leader or as a storyteller? Um, as I said, you know, uh, 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 the, 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 the primary book to read about the connection of Reb Nachman's tales to the bigger picture is uh, my professor David Roski's book, A Bridge of Longing, which is a magnificent chapter about Reb Nachman's stories that Dr. Roski describes as a kind of spiritual triage when Reb Nachman's uh, efforts to unite the Hasidic movement crashed and burned in the middle of the first decade of the 19th century, that's when Reb Nachman begins telling stories. Stories are a very small part of his output. Reb Nachman single-handedly in the space of a decade, and when I say single-handedly, he had a big apparatus supporting this, but single-mouthedly produced a library of texts. Only 13 stories were published in a sanctified way, and these were told at the absolute low point of his career. So he's far better known and you know, far more revered as a religious philosopher, as a religious leader, than as a storyteller. The argument that I'm trying to make on the shoulders of Dr. Roski's uh, uh, research is that nonetheless the stories for their minority, for their smallness, for their insignificance, animate and illuminate something very profound about Reb Nachman's whole project. Um, we hear in Reb Nachman's voice in the story something that we don't encounter elsewhere. And the most profound aspect, the most modern aspect of that, is the doubts that Reb Nachman dramatizes about his own spiritual calling. There is no other place in his writing that is so experimental, so confrontational, um, so vulnerable as his stories. And that's the importance that I place on, on, on them for his work as a whole. So the question is, um, I, had, I had mentioned that after returning to the Soviet Union, uh, uh, Der Nister becomes a good worker for the state, he reforms his aesthetic, he becomes a socialist realist, and he manages to achieve the great work of Yiddish socialist realism, uh, 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 this very large novel, very magnificently translated, The Family Mashper. Um, and the question is, well, but how do you do that, and did he really abandon his symbolist techniques, and didn't he get grief from the regime anyway? And the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Um, Denister becomes a socialist realist partly because the regime said, now is the time for everybody to write one way. You know, the per in the 1920s, there were very lively, very contentious, and ultimately very dangerous debates about artistic and aesthetic propriety in the new regime. By 1929, those debates begin to shut down, and by 1934, they have a word, they have a label for the new style, socialist realism. And Denister says, in one of the only letters that we have surviving from him, he says, I've got to conform to the new regime. But the way he describes this, it's not just I've got to conform because the regime is demanding it. It's also, I need to do this for myself. I need to write in a different way. The old way of writing uh, uh, these avant-garde stories, it, it doesn't work for me anymore for whatever reason. I have to be a team player now. And what we see in the family mashbear which is why it's such a fascinating novel, which is why it works even for those of us who have a choice to read things other than socialist realist novels, which I hope is true of everybody in the room. Um, he smuggles the, sim the symbolist aesthetic in to the socialist realism, and he does so in very classical realist forms, in the dream sequences, in madness. You know, you know, you know, there is a space for the life of the unconscious, even in the realist novel. And that's where we see the, the old Dernister. It's like, um, you know, it, 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 it's like, let's say, you know, someone was a great jazz guy, and he had his own avant-garde quartet in the 1960s, but then he gets married and he needs to feed his family. So he goes to work for, you know, a rhythm and blues band or for a swing band in Las Vegas. And you go to hear him, and it's so sad that he's not making this avant-garde music anymore, but then they give him a solo, and you recognize, oh, it's back. That's the guy I came to hear. You know, Dennister 
reveals himself in those moments as being the same writer he was 20 years before. And he did have a lot of problems with the novel. The novel was supposed to be a trilogy. Only two parts were published. Uh, the second part was only published in New York originally. You know, he couldn't publish the second part in the Soviet Union. And of course, we knew he had, you know, he had all sorts of grief by the time World War II was over. So, um, uh, 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 part of the greatness of the novel is its resistance to the brand name socialist realis realism. And part of it is also its subversive success in, in meeting the criteria of the genre, but, but never signing on with its, with its, always keeping one foot in the, uh, in the world of actual literature and not just state dictates. It's a great novel. You really owe it to, you know, even if you don't like avant-garde short stories, if, you, if you've got, it's great beach reading. Um, if, 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 if you're on the Black Sea. <laughs> I could, I would take about 350 pages, but bear with me. The night is young. Um, no, to try to put it succinctly, um, I think that, you know, the, the, the schema that you rehearsed for us is a very useful one in uh, tracing a certain development within Jewish thought, but necessarily an incomplete one. What interests me is not the forward momentum going, from, going inevitably from Lurianic Kabbalah to Martin Buber and, you know, and, 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 and everything turns, you know, you know uh, 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 Jewish literature achieves its aesthetic perfection with the publication of I and Thou. That doesn't interest me. What interests me are the traces, the residues, the echoes that interfere with the linear development of one line of thought, the echoes from the margins. And the way that marginality plays itself out, and this is specific, this is specific to Jewish consciousness, but it's not unique to Jewish consciousness. And this is like a very gratifying thing to know. Oh, I thought it was just Jews that have this. No, you know, lots of people do. It has to do with an experience of history. And the concept of history is a modern concept. I mean, Herodotus. Thucydides, but really the concept of a historical consciousness is part of the apparatus of modernization. Jews enter the modern world in Eastern Europe late. Jews have an experience of autonomy, an experience of isolation, an experience of internal cohesion that is disrupted over the course of the second half of the 18th century. I'm speaking specifically about Eastern European Jews in the, in the old Commonwealth of Poland that gets broken apart by the Austrian Empire, by the Russian Empire, by the Prussian Empire. That experience is the beginnings of Jewish modernity. And that's why it's so important for me to say that where Reb Nachman is at in an aesthetic sense, is the world of the mid-17th century, that he's 150 years behind what German aesthetics were doing at the same time. But being behind, being belated, makes you anticipatory. It, make, it, it primes you for what's coming next. It, it enables you to experience a compression of modernity that sets the stage for you becoming avant-garde just by showing up. Uh, uh, and that's the, that is the uh, privileged position of literature and Jewish languages in 19th century Europe, the ability to anticipate what, com what comes next. What is modernism? Modernism is a confrontation with the crisis of modernity that engulfs Europe when? In 1864, in 1914, in 1929. Modernity is always a crisis for people on the margins because it always comes as part of a, uh, someone else's apparatus, somebody else's ideology. And that's, that's what I'm suggesting about the uses of minority for understanding a specifically Jewish modernism that begins way before Baudelaire, way before uh, uh, um, Stefan Mallarmé, way before uh, the Symbolist Movement or the Surrealist Movement or Virginia Woolf. Um, <laughs> Thank you.